let's talk about it. Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. Welcome to this video. Today I'm going to be speaking to you about the structure of a research project. More specifically, I'm going to focus on the sections within a research project so that you know exactly what goes where. At the outset, I think it's important that whatever structure you use, that you first run it by your particular department or the university where you are doing the research. Keep in mind that every university, every department, every discipline even, could have different prerequisites as to how the structure of a research project should look like. Another factor, of course, are the preferences of the supervisor. So ensure that you also run this by him and her before you start writing, especially the proposal. So although there might be deviations from university to university or discipline to discipline, the important thing is that what I'm going to present you with is pretty much standard across the board. The structure itself is crucial and it's more than merely the different sections within the document because it's about the logic that applies. In fact, the sections within the structure reflect the logic that you as a researcher apply. I talk more about the logic of the sections in the video about the readability of your research project. So please have a look at that. So it's important that you understand upfront that doing research is like telling a story. This story must be well articulated with a structure that has sections in it that are clear, well-defined, and explain to the reader everything that he or she needs to know about the story. How does the structure of a research project typically look like? Let's look at it. The first part is the introduction and background. This is where you introduce the reader to the story. You introduce the reader to the study and you give a broad perspective on who the players are, who are the most important institutions or bodies or, or consumers or households or whatever the story might be, whatever the study might be about. Who are they? Why is there maybe a problem? What is the background that, that plays into this problem? It's about setting the scene. It's about setting the tone. It's about introducing the reader to the story. I cannot stress the importance of this introduction and background enough. If you do not capture the reader right up front, it's going to be very difficult to maintain their attention as they read through the project. So make sure that the background is well written so that you can capture the reader so that they understand the context, in particular the context, that leads up to the problem, which is the next section. Now, identifying the problem, very important. If you do not have a problem, you do not have a study. And the problem itself must be significant enough that it justifies you spending the time on the study. So if there's nothing worth fixing or correcting or addressing or solving, why do the study? The problem is essential to justify the motivation driving the study. And specifically, the problem statement must be significant enough that it justifies the proposed value that your study will bring to the fore. And this value can be defined in several ways. Either you are addressing the problem, solving the problem, even shedding light on the problem. The comment that I always tend to leave with regards to critiquing a problem statement is I ask the student, so what? Why is this important? Why is this a problem? You must articulate the problem in such a way that the reader is clear that this problem needs to be addressed. If that is not made clear, your study doesn't have value. Now, there are two parts to a problem statement, which I cover in the detailed video. Please watch that video to see what the two parts of the problem statement are. Once you've established what the problem is, you then go on to the objectives or the research questions posed by your study. These research questions or objectives or aim provide the purpose of your study. It tells the reader what your study sets out to achieve. And more specifically, it sets out to try and address the problem that you highlighted in the previous section. So if your objectives are not clear, it's not clear what your study is about. It's important that your objectives are well articulated so that when you get to the end of the study, 
it's quite straightforward to answer them. And what I mean by this is that they must not be woolly. They must not be double barreled. They must not be unclear or fuzzy. They must be specific and focused. Especially at PhD level, what I ask my students to do is to divide their secondary objectives into the literature-based objectives and the empirical-based objectives. In that way, there's a clear distinction between what objectives are based on the literature as such and what objectives are based on the empirical part of the study. Now we get to the literature review. And this is one of the tougher parts for students, especially as they start off. As one of my professors used to tell me, you've got to be prepared to get your hands dirty. You've got to read as much as you can. In a previous video, where I speak about the four reasons that you should consider before you're doing your research, I talk about reading, reading, reading. It's crucial that you read. You've got to read everything on the topic as much as you can and make sure that you get a good view of what the perspectives, what the debates, what the theories say. If you don't know what the current debates and arguments are in that specific field, then how can your study make any contribution? Put differently, can you as a researcher have an opinion, have a view on this field of study if you don't know what the status quo is, if you don't know what the debates are, if you don't know what the arguments are? I don't think so. In fact, you can't. Doing a literature review is essential for you as a researcher to enable you to be part of the discussions, to be part of the arguments, to be part of the debates. Without this literature review, without a thorough understanding of what the readings are, without a thorough understanding of what the current thinking is, you simply cannot be part of the debate. Your study then cannot make a contribution if you don't know what has been written on it. Only when you know what has been written on it can you argue the research gap that your study proposes to fill. Make no mistake, this is a long process. Reading takes months, sometimes years at a PhD level. But you simply have to do it. Because if your study claims to make a contribution, you have to first argue that there is a gap. Once you've conducted the literature review, you then move on to the research methods section. And here we delve into the specifics of what, who, when, where, how. More specifically, what is it that you are investigating? And how are you going to investigate this what? Also, who are you going to investigate? When are you going to investigate them? What data are you going to be collecting from them? How are you going to be collecting this data? How are you going to be analyzing this data? These are the questions that govern the research methodology section. So from a structure point of view, a research methodology section has a few sections that are important. Firstly, the research design. You want to tell the reader whether your study is a quantitative based research or a qualitative based research design. Then you focus on the sampling design. Who are you going to interview? Who are you going to send the survey to? What jobs do they perform? Is it a certain management line, job function? Is it a certain group of people? Is it a certain culture? Is it in a certain geographical location? Once you've established who your sample is and where they are and how much they are, you must discuss the data collection methods. In other words, are you going to be sending out a survey? And how are you going to be sending out the survey? Are you going to be delivering it to them? Are you going to be picking it up? Are you going to be emailing it to them? Or are you going to be doing a focus group? Are you going to be doing interviews? Where will the interviews be? How many participants might be part of the focus group? How many focus groups will there be? Will it be recorded? These are the sorts of questions you answer when you're writing up the data collection methods section. Next, you deal with the data analysis techniques. In other words, are you going to be doing statistics? Is it going to be descriptive in nature? Are you going to be doing inferential statistics? What techniques specifically are you going to be using? What software are you going to be using? Will you be doing the analysis yourself? Will you be using a statistician? Once the reader has read the data analysis section, it must be clear as to how the data will be handled, how the data will be analyzed. And then finally, the last part of the research method section is typically your ethical considerations. 
Has your study received ethical approval? And was it approved by the ethics committee within the university? And you normally quote the reference number or the ethical approval number so that the reader is ensured that your study is governed by the ethical requirements set out by your university. The next section in a research project is typically the findings section. And here you highlight the findings based on the methods you applied and described in your research methodology section. An important consideration here is that you must report the findings. A discussion on these findings is not appropriate for the findings section. So you must avoid an explicit interpretation of the findings. But of course, I want to reiterate that every university is different, every department is different, every discipline is different, and for that matter, the preferences of your supervisor must also be considered. We then get to the business end of your research, and that is the recommendations. So typically, for me at least, what I would ask a student to do is to first discuss the findings. It's important that they contextualize how these findings fill the gap. So in this discussion section of the findings, I expect to see a lot of literature. I expect to see a lot of the sources and literature that were dealt with in the literature review chapter. Because in the literature review chapter, you argued what the existing thinking was, what the existing debates were. But now in the recommendation section, the discussion on these findings, you are discussing how your study adds to the existing debates, adds to the existing thinking. What I then ask the student to do is to focus on both the theoretical contribution as well as the practical managerial contribution. So where the discussion in the previous section focuses more on showing where the arguments fit in with the existing literature, the theoretical contribution is more specific in terms of how the study and the findings add to existing theories. In any research project at a university, you would expect there to be a theoretical contribution. So it's crucial that the theoretical contribution is clearly defined and clearly established. So by way of example, if there had to be a textbook written on this particular topic and all the existing theories were set out in this textbook, would your theoretical contribution be an additional theory that is added? You want the answer to this to be yes. Why would you spend all this time, all these years on this study if you made no theoretical contribution? There should also be practical managerial contributions or implications based on the findings of your study. In other words, you want to make practical proposals to managers in this particular area of specialization or the context of the study it might be in the banking sector, it might be in the construction sector, it might be in the tourism sector, whatever sector, there needs to be practical recommendations that management can implement to improve their business. So both the theoretical and practical contributions are essential. If you cannot establish that you've made some sort of contribution, again, why did you do the study? These recommendations will hold you accountable to the primary objective or the aim that you established in your first chapter. And what a lot of reviewers do when they assess, for example, a master's or a PhD thesis is they read the first section where you discuss your objectives and your problem statement. And then after that, directly after that, they read your contribution and conclusion section, your final chapter, your final section. And if there is no golden thread between what you state that you are going to achieve and what you actually achieved, then that could be considered a problem with regards to the way you conducted the research. And the final section is the conclusion. Yeah, you give a general overview and synopsis of what the major contribution of the study was. And it's sort of the ending to your study. It's the ending to your story. It's the final five minutes of a movie where it, there is conclusion. After the conclusion, of course, you have your reference list and bibliography where you list all your references cited within your document. So that's a bird's eye view of what a research project entails in terms of its structure. I hope I've added some value to you and that you will not be as intimidated with regards to actually start writing. Just start writing. I guarantee you it will help you to get going. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Please click the like button. Please click the subscribe button as well as the bell so that I can notify you when I drop my next video. 
I will see you next time.